opened by the Prince of Wales. The line was built entirely in tunnels 10 feet in diameter and since it ran across central London from east to west, there was never much fear that it would fail from lack of passengers. Today it's just known as the Central and serves stations along its route including Oxford Circus, Bond Street and Holborn. The Central London Railway was immediately popular with the travelling public. Over 14 million passengers were carried by the end of the first year. The system was popular because it adopted an American idea of a flat rate fare with no classes. And it also looked to the USA for its technology. The original Central London electric locomotives were, well, they were called camelbacks because they had a cab in the middle and two sloping bonnets on either side, which were built in America by the General Electric Company. They were shipped to England in boxes and assembled in London. One of them was dropped off a barge into the River Thames and had to be fished out before they could build it. The passenger cars were over 45 feet long and weighed 14 tonnes. Gatemen controlled iron gates at each end of the cars, allowing passengers to board. The railway used direct current for its traction power. This electricity was picked up by the locomotive from a third rail positioned in the middle of the two running rails. When you want to start an electric motor driving a train, if you start it with all the power all at once, it'll either go into a skid or the motor will blow up because it's had too much power when it's standing still. So you have to apply the power gradually, rather the same way as you change up in your gears in the car. And the way they do it is they put a grid of resistors in the circuit with the motor, and the resistance reduces the amount of current getting into the motor circuit. And as you want to accelerate, you gradually step out the resistances one by one, you cut them out, and if you listen, you can hear that happening, click, 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 as the train accelerates out of the station. In 1900, London's population was fast approaching seven million and there was a heavy reliance on the tube system to move these millions quickly and efficiently. But there was still a problem with the locomotives. The time taken to uncouple the locomotive when you got to the end of the line and find another one to put on the other end of the train to return to go back was taking up a lot of time and reducing the service. So they introduced what was called multiple unit control. They achieved this by putting two of the motors at one end of the train and two at the other underneath the passenger cars. The resistors and electrical equipment were put into a space above the motors. All the driver had to do when he wanted to change direction was to shut down the cab at one end, walk down the train, get in the cab at the other end and he was ready to go. Over the next few years, there was really a railway mania with many, many uh, companies and organisations promoting railways, very few of which ever saw the light of day. But three did, forming part of today's Northern Line, Bakerloo Line and Piccadilly Line. And all three had been given sanction by the government to go ahead, but all three were running into financial trouble. And that's when uh, the American financier, Charles Tyson Yerkes, uh, came to the rescue. Charles Tyson Yerkes arrived in London with his wife and several girlfriends, leaving behind in the USA a shady reputation. Questionable business activities led to a prison sentence back home for misusing funds. Charles Tyson Yerkes is a fascinating character. To many people, he is the embodiment of the crooked Victorian businessman. But I think it's important to remember that, of course, he merely operated in the business climate of the day. He wasn't responsible for the first Underground Railway, um, but what he brought was basically access to several important things. He brought access to American money to develop the very expensive tube railways being built in London at the turn of the century, and he brought access to American technology, particularly in the electrical field. By 1902, Yerkes had become the chairman of the newly formed Underground Electric Railways Company of London Limited, with a capital of $4 million. Yerkes set about buying up the new underground lines. He also built a new power plant at Lotts Road by the Thames in Chelsea, which was great for being supplied with coal. He believed that if you supplied your own power, you increased your profits. The Lotts Road power plant, which is still there today, was built to specifications exactly the same as for American powerhouses, except this one was big. It was one of the biggest power stations in the world. 
It contained eight turbo generators running at 1,000 revs per minute, developing 65,000 horsepower. The opening of Yerke's first tube lines in 1906 and the increasing electrification of his subsurface railways increasingly spelt the death knell of steam locomotives in use on the central area of London Underground. Progressively they were forced to the suburbs and eventually the entire network was electrically operated. When the underground was first electrified, it was decided to use a four rail system, which is almost unique in the world. The positive one is on the outside of the rails, and then there's the one in the centre, which is the negative rail. That system was chosen with an insulated return, because even in those early days of electrification, it was realised that if the return went through the running rails and through earth, it could cause problems with corrosion of water pipes and other uh, metal in the ground, including our own tunnel segments. Charles Yerkes had achieved his first goal by making an efficient, electrically powered network. The system he set up at the beginning of the century is still more or less in place today. But how to give the entire underground system a uniform identity would be Yerkes' next challenge. Modern styling and improved design would be the answer. 55 Broadway, St James's Park. This is the headquarters of London Transport. You know, to me, it looks a lot like the headquarters of that other great 1930s institution, the BBC. And like the BBC, it aimed to educate its customers as well as to either transport or entertain them. Yerkes had set the underground on the path that would lead to here, but first he had to unify the whole system. By 1905, Yerkes had achieved his aim of electrifying the three deep level railways under London. To unify the system, he employed a young architect, Leslie Green, to design stations that were distinctive and conspicuous. The minute you see one of these stations, it says London Underground, because it uses the tiles, these maroon glazed tiles, always the same. You also have the, all those Edwardian obsessions with kind of an English variant on Art Nouveau. You've got craftsmanship and wood and no expense spared. So these were lavish stations in their time. And they've lasted the test of time extraordinarily well. The minute you walk into a Leslie Green station, you know you're on the London Underground. They made something like 11 Leslie Green stations in two years between 1904 and 1906, which is probably why he died a, a year later, they say, of exhaustion, age 33. But he left behind a, a, an extraordinary heritage for London. Yerkes didn't live to see his tube empire grow. He died in December 1905 in New York. And the following year, he was replaced by another American, Albert Stanley. Stanley brought even more American influence from the US and took over as general manager of the Underground Company. He set about buying the London bus companies. It was the only mode of transport that actually made money. And secondly, and probably even more importantly, he employed Frank Pick as his deputy in 1906. Pick became the man responsible for branding and styling London Underground. This included the rolling stock, upholstery, lighting, architecture and vitally graphic design. The underground when they first opened the new tube lines had the names of the stations simply fired into the tiles at either end of the platform. One of the first changes they made so that the station name was distinctive was to have the name printed on a, uh, an enamel plate with behind it a, a red symbol so that the, the lettering is on white on a, a blue plate with a red disc behind it. The iconic circle with the bar across it became a symbol of the underground and has remained its logo ever since. This joined the separate tube lines into one company. It was called the Underground for the first time in 1908 and of course the name has stuck. The newly branded company also modernised its stock as the modern tube continued to take shape. To increase efficiency, the underground had to find a way of getting people on and off the tubes more quickly. They solved the problem 
by the 1920s by building trains which had sliding doors on the sides and the tops of the doors followed the roof profile so that there was headroom for people to get on and off. And this stop became known as the standard stop because so much of it was built that it was practically standard across all of the Yerkes tubes. The underground now had a modern identity and modern trains to go with it. But now it was about to play a major role on shaping the future of the capital above ground. The system had expanded outwards and in 1908 one line came to the surface to the north of London in open countryside. In the next few years, an entire new community, Hampstead Garden suburb, developed around the underground station. Stanley and his investors realized that there was a neat profit to be made in the expansion and the building of the suburbs. And so did their arch rivals, the Metropolitan. Together, they expanded beyond London, creating a new suburbia. The Metropolitan Railway had the smart idea of actually buying up land either side of the railway as it was developed out into the countryside and then later using that land to develop their own housing estates. So they got the double benefit of not only uh, the profits from the houses themselves but also the profits from the people who bought those houses then travelling in daily into London. The centre of London started to cease being the place where everyone lived. The rapid growth in desirable suburban housing meant that the centre became reinvented as the place to visit for entertainment, shopping. From very early on, the people who run the London transport system realised that what they were selling was not a transport system, but a city. See, if you're selling tickets on the tube, you don't say, come on the tube, it's great fun. You say, go to the theatre, it's great fun, and go by tube. Or you say, go shopping in the department stores, it's great, go by tube. The network had now fundamentally altered the balance of London, reaching even more people. But the investors wanted even more passengers to travel, and Frank Pick developed a massive poster campaign to get them on board, using modern artists to promote every aspect of the great metropolis London was becoming. The tube wasn't just for work, it was for leisure too. By the 1920s and 30s, the underground was producing a really large number of, of posters and they had easily fulfilled their function of just publicising the system and getting people to use the underground. And they became much more than that. They became a way of actually promoting London. So they've sold the West End as the place to shop, the place to play, the place to drink, the place to flirt, the place to do all of those things. Consciously, posters saying, Come to the West End, it's great. Go to the theatre, oh, it's wonderful. Go to Selfridges and spend your money and, and buy a two-bob ticket. That's what they sold, and we bought it. The marketing and poster campaigns exemplified the forward thinking and innovation of the underground, but in the engineering department, old technology was still serving them well. The original braking system that was used on London Underground was designed by George Westinghouse of America in the 1870s. It consisted basically of compressed air supply, which provided you with a constant supply of air, and the air was to use in the brake cylinders, and the brake cylinders were used to push a block against the wheel to slow it down during braking. And on each car, a thing called a triple valve, and the triple valve recharged the brakes, released the brakes, and applied the brakes, so it had three functions. Technical expertise and simplicity were the watchwords of London Underground, a simplicity and cleanliness of thought personified by Frank Pick and his architects. In 1923, he employed Charles Henry Holden to design the stations on the City and South London Railway Extension. Holden went on to create a house design and provided a modern facade that can still be seen in some of his best examples of station design. The design was a very clever one based on simple geometric shapes and using a modern material and concrete for the roofs, but using traditional brickwork designs for the main body of the building, and creating what now in retrospect is some of the best modern building designs in London and, and perhaps in the rest of Britain as well. But in one key area, the underground was far from simple. As the network expanded, it was becoming increasingly difficult to follow and understand the map or route planner. An alternative was needed. 
ironically, managed to do so much to give London Transport its own unique image, had himself recently been made redundant by the underground. In 1931, electrical draftsman Harry Beck had time on his hands after the underground had let him go. So he set about producing the world's first diagrammatic map. His solution was radical. He redesigned the underground map as an electrical circuit, abandoning truth for the sake of clarity. The centre of the map, where all the most complicated interchanges are, was expanded in relation to the outer areas. At first, the underground rejected his design because it was too revolutionary and because it wasn't geographically accurate. But eventually, for the meagre fee of five guineas or five pounds 25, they bought his map and published it in 1933. It was an immediate success. The diagrammatic map is now used all over the world. And what's more, the map helps us understand how this city links up and what our place is in one of the world's greatest metropolises. Harry Beck wasn't exactly praised during his time at London Transport. In fact, on one occasion, a bureaucrat tinkered with his design and then had the gall to put his own name on the bottom of the map. But in 2013, that changed slightly when a blue plaque was erected at Harry Beck's house, where he was born in Leighton in 1902. He died in 1974. By the 1930s, control of all the tube companies had passed to the London Transport Board and the first steps towards nationalisation were taken. But during the 1930s, the increasing population was making further demands on the system. Increasing the lines was one thing, but the trains had to carry more people. One of the major problems of all the pre-1935 trains built for London Underground was that you had the switch compartment behind the driver and that used up 15% of the available passenger space. By 1935, they had sufficient design progress to put most of the equipment below the floor. Motors were smaller, the compressors were smaller, all the power supply systems were smaller, and they produced these prototype trains in 1935. The London Underground has played a vital role in the lives of Londoners, but it was in the dark days of World War II that the bond 